Hello, Attached to Hygiene listeners. This week, we were supposed to play part two of our interview on the Asia Pacific market. But as we were getting ready for this episode, we realized that the day this episode launches, June 20th, 2022, will be the first day of World Continents Week, which is an annual initiative to raise awareness about incontinence related issues. And since we already had two episodes on incontinence planned, we decided to slot this one into our lineup. So we'll finish up our interview on the APAC market in our next episode, and then have another incontinence product user panel after that. So with that, we'll start the episode. If you design and produce incontinence products, you know that products have evolved quite a bit in the last 20 or 30 years, and the people who use them would certainly acknowledge that. But those same people who are managing incontinence are often already dealing with shame, embarrassment, and fear from their condition. And if the product they use fails them, and their condition is outed, or they're embarrassed in public, it can have serious consequences on their mental health and well-being and their lives overall. If it fails, they don't care if a product is thinner or more sustainable or more stylish. With a condition like incontinence, the product just has to work. And for a producer like you, getting that product to work is a big challenge given all of the variables involved. People with incontinence not only have different degrees and severities of the condition, but also are different sizes and weights, have different activity levels, and prefer different types of products. So while this is challenging, it is absolutely critical that producers, as well as everyone else supporting the supply chain, listen closely to these voices and continually work to find new ways to improve these products. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the products, it's about the dignity and quality of people's lives. And what could be more important than that? So how can you do that? Luckily, Bostic is here to help. Welcome to Attached to Hygiene, the podcast that enables you to grow your knowledge and influence in the absorbent hygiene industry. My name is Jack Hughes, and my mission is to help you, the absorbent hygiene article producer, design and produce the best possible products to meet the needs of your consumers. For today's episode, we're partnering with Alan Cottonton. Alan is Emeritus Professor of Incontinence Technology at University College London, and he has spent the last 40 years studying technology for managing incontinence. But even though Alan's title and experience with incontinence technology by itself would be enough to call him an expert on the subject, that isn't the main reason we asked him to join the show today. No, the reason we asked him to join us today is because as part of his studies over the last 40 years, he has spent a lot of time speaking with people across the globe about how they manage their incontinence. He has spoken with dozens, if not hundreds of people about their experience with incontinence, the impact it has had on their lives and how they manage it. And one of the ways he has had these conversations is through panels, where he interviews multiple people at the same time about their incontinence. And given that he has decades of experience in running these panels, we asked him to do this for the podcast today. Luckily, he agreed, as did three panelists who were not only willing to speak about their experience, but let us record their stories and feedback on products so that we could share that with you. Each one of them will share their experience with incontinence and how they manage it on a daily basis, and then share what improvements or changes they'd like to see made to the products that are available on the market. Also that you can then take that information and design and produce better absorbent incontinence products. Joining me today to facilitate this incontinence product user panel is Alan Cottonen. Alan, thank you for joining us today. Before I have you introduce our panelists, I'd like to have you briefly introduce yourself to our audience. So please, please introduce yourself. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Emeritus Professor of Incontinence Technology at University College London. 
Well, I started out life as, as a material scientist. That was my first training. But for the last 40 years or so, my passion has been working with technology for managing incontinence, which is a rather strange thing for a material scientist to do, I guess. Of course, people who have incontinence would really rather like to be cured, but we can't always do that. That's not always possible. So, so then the focus has to lift on to what we can do to manage the leakage that can't be prevented. And that's, that's where my focus has been. And if you want to do that well, then you better find out from the people who are going to use these products what is important to them, what matters and so on. So I've actually spent a lot of time over those 40 years talking with people like the panel of folk that we have with us today, because they all of them have misbehaving bladders that they have to manage in one way or another. And they have very kindly agreed to explain to us, to share with us what that's like, how they manage it what their dreams might be for products that would deal with things better. So let me start by introducing them to you, and then we'll, we'll kick off by asking some questions. So first off, we have a lady called Tonika, who's from the Netherlands. And then from the UK, we have Rebecca, and we also have Chris, who between them have a diversity of, of experiences of this business of managing misbehaving bladders, and possibly bowels. I'm sure they'll tell us about that if that's part of the equation too. So can we start with you, Tonica? I wonder if you could just tell us, uh, how does how does your bladder misbehave and, and what impact does that have on you? Well, it's my bladder and my bowels, so it's quite a lot of impact. I've got urge problems, but I've also got uh, Parkinson's disease, so I'm not uh, and, and never quick enough on the toilet. And I manage that with huge pets. It affects my life because it, it sometimes got leakage. I'd hardly dare to go outside. So that restricts what you can do both at home and in terms of what you can do outside of the home, is that yes, right? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Wow. And you mentioned your bowel. How does that fit into the mix? Oh, well, that started uh, about my puberty and uh, I've got obstipation and as bad as I have to look for the word, paradoxal diarrhea. And that is absolutely hell. Right. And all the things I used and I consequently use laxation stuff. And Laxatives, I, yeah. Every day I have to do anal irrigation to keep my bowels going. And yeah. even then, I quite often uh, miss the toilet. Okay, so that's, that's quite a, a complex of issues for you to think yeah. about over and above the ordinary <laughs> things of life. Well, thank you for that. Let's, let's see, see about Rebecca. Rebecca, or do we call you Spider-Man? I see this amazing poster on the wall behind you. <laughs> no, no doubt Spider-Man will get in thing. on the act somewhere. But what, so <laughs> tell us about your, your bladder. What does it do? Right, so I think mine probably started postnatal. So I've got two children, but my first daughter I had complications with the birth. She decided to come out. Um, if, but since we're on Superman, superhero, she came out like Superman. So she came out with her hand and her arm over her head which obviously stretched me to the limit. And I thought afterwards that the, the leakage that I was getting was something that every mother got, but it's just continued. And my daughter is now going to be 18 soon. So, so I still have that issue. The other issue I have is that my bladder doesn't empty properly. So when I think I've finished going to the toilet, there's always a little egg cup full of wee just sitting there that will catch me out next time I sneeze or cough or laugh or do anything. So those are the issues that I have. Now, I'm a really fit person. So I do Pilates, I do yoga, I do HIIT training, I even do pole cl um, d class lessons. So my core is absolutely spot on and I do do pelvic floors. But unfortunately, all that aside, I still do have these problems. So it's, it's minimal and I can manage it in a way, but there are times that it does catch me out and it can be obviously quite embarrassing. So... Got you. So it sounds as if the leakage you're talking about is perhaps less than Tonica's 
describing, but maybe the not knowing is quite a factor for you, the, the, the risk all the time. Is that? Yeah, is that I mean, it can literally happen, you know, obviously it's worse when I've got colds and coughs, but I also, I'm also a hay fever sufferer, so the summer is always a bad time for me. And of course, you tend to be wearing skimpier clothing in the summer or tight jeans, or I quite often, I've said I'm a fit person, I'm con- constantly wearing leggings. And I've had situations where I've had to walk around with, you know, wet patches. So, yeah, it does get in the way. Thank you. How about how about you, Chris? Hi there, Alan. Yeah, I've got more of a similar story, the tonica. And I started out with bedwetting, uh, urinary uh, problems at night. But then I've gone on to have an overactive bladder in the day. And then about four or five years ago, I started to have issues with my bowels as well. I was born with quite a rare metabolic condition and I'm not sure whether that may, it's not down as one of the main symptoms of that condition, but I think it may have exacerbated. I'm similar to Tonica in a sense, I I really do use big products. I will lose the whole bladder. I've got overactive bladder. So, you know, I get to the door with a classic key in the, in the lock and then I will go. I get out my car or I hear running water. And also, unfortunately, I've got overactive bowels and and I've also got recently diagnosed with bowel bile malabsorption issues, which gives me loose bowels. And then unlike Rebecca, my I haven't got a very good core and my pelvic floor isn't brilliant. And that combination has, has, has left me effectively doubly incontinent. I've got a son that's 11, so I, I still have to carry on and go out and do things. And it just means I've ended up, you know, having to use very, very big products. And like, like everyone with this issue, the embarrassment, the shame, uh, like Tonica, you know, products don't always work. And there's always that fear that you're going to have an accident that's going to be obvious to people. And obviously, bowel issues are harder to hide. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how long you've had the issue for. It's still when you're out in public, it's, you know, not the thing you're ex- you're expected to do so it, you, you carry all this shame and embarrassment and even the products as, as Rebecca was saying I in the summer I like to wear shorts I don't want to necessarily but then I end up having to think about the color of the shorts I have to think about whether you can see a pad I always wear a t-shirt so you can't switch off from it you know everything requires planning you know where the loos are where you can change and all that sort of thing it, it's it's difficult so are there things, Chris, that you you don't do that you would like to because of this? Or is it you do those things, but they are harder work, you have to think about them more? There are things I don't do. I'd like to go swimming. I'd like to go swimming. And I, and I like Tonica. I, I do bowel clearance that helps. And I know that. But again, I, I closely sympathise with her that it doesn't always work. So, yeah, you might or with Rebecca with a little bit of leakage, you know, you get everything out and you think everything's out and then you still have a problem with three or four hours later. So things like right. swimming, I'd like to go swimming and I can't, but I try lots of things like shopping, going out, picking my son up from school, you know, I've got to do, but yep. something wow. like swimming, which I would like to do, I don't do because of the fear of the issues it would bring on. Gotcha. So it sounds like that's a kind of a mix of things that you don't do. We're just on the too difficult pile. There are other things that you do, but you have to plan some more and there are risks involved. And and, and I see the others nodding as I'm saying this. And, and in fact, they were nodding as you were describing. So there's a kind of a, I think we're talking the same language here. How about, how about you, Tonica? I didn't ask you too much about the impact on your life. Are there things that you can't do that you would like to or things that are very difficult it's, well touch and go but yes the swimming is a big part for uh, for me as well i don't mm-hmm. dare it i've got anal tampons but they don't work at all i hit them out uh, immediately so that doesn't work and mm-hmm. also the insecurity you feel that's the main problem if it come wrong once you're absolutely scared to death that it happens again right and you feel uh, so, how do I say it? I always have to go out, if I go out, with an extra bag with my clean stuff and yeah. all the packages. And that's absolutely a bag, uh, quite a size. It's not a normal handbag or a shopper. It's yeah. more. 
Yeah. And you always have to look after if it's the same color so they won't see that I changed things okay, like that. Okay, gotcha. It's funny. And if you don't have to do it, it sounds not too bad. But if yeah. you have to do it constantly, it's yeah. difficult. And also, you... I've got another problem. If I, to go to bed in that funny uh, diaper kind of thing, that's not nice either. Eh? Right, right. And do you do you sleep away from home sometimes? Can you go on vacation or how does that? Well, yes, we do, uh, but uh, we have to go by car because I have to take such a huge <laughs> amount of stuff that yeah. uh, I only can go uh, on holiday by car. Yeah, understood. How about you, Rebecca? Are there particular restrictions for you, particular things that you can't do or that are too difficult or energy consuming? Yeah, I think the key word there was planning ahead. So, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, my issues are quite significantly less than my, my two friends here. But I loved what um, was said about taking a spare change of clothes that's the same colour. What a clever idea, so that people don't realise that you've changed. Yeah. I mean, I quite often layer up. So if I do have an accident, then I can take something off and I can tie it around my waist. Sorry, can I just say, so by layer up, you mean you're wearing several layers of Wearing several clothes, layers, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I need to make sure that wherever we're going, that there's going to be a toilet available. So I'm a dog walker. So obviously you don't get dog, you don't get toilets necessarily out in the public. So if thinking back, I think those probably most of the times that I've been caught out actually whilst I've been walking the dogs, but then it doesn't matter. I'm out in the field somewhere and nobody's going to see that I've, I've wet myself. So that's not a problem. But yeah, I think I mean, uh, we've a family with um, several issues anyway. Obviously, we I've mentioned in the introduction that we, um, my kids have got autism, but um, we also have celiac disease in the family as well. So we're we're quite familiar with digestive problems and what what comes as a result of that. And so it's quite a natural thing for us to plan ahead for these sorts of things anyway. So I have to plan ahead for my daughter for toilet stops just in case she got contaminated anyway. So, yeah, I think planning ahead is, is a key thing. So I don't think anything is necessarily not in my reach, but it's just that I have to plan ahead to be able to do those things. Yeah, yeah. got you. Something that you each have mentioned in your ways is secrecy involved as it were you know that you're trying to cover this thing up there's a secrecy issue here is that am i right is that a big thing for you I, i'm guessing you don't tell everybody what your situation is and you don't want to broadcast it no. publicly but is that is that somewhere near the core of what you're talking about chris you're nodding away here is that do you identify with that yeah no no i do i mean i doing something like this i wouldn't have been able to do a few years ago and I've got better at talking to people, but there are close friends that know about my condition and there are close friends that don't know about my condition. And there are work colleagues that know about it and work colleagues that don't know about it. And it, it's, um, I do hide it. And there's obviously situations I have pads delivered and they've gone to the wrong address and I don't necessarily want my neighbours to know about it. And even in a healthcare environment, I don't always want the healthcare professionals to know about it either because I don't want to be defined in, in, in those terms. And there is this shame and guilt and hidden world. And as Tonica said, I, I have a bag as well. And I've put all my stuff and like Tonica, I have a big bag, but I put it in like a laptop bag and I've got multiple layers of things. So if it does flip open, it's not obvious that there's pads in there or things. So yeah. if my clothing reflects that I hide the pad, I always wear a T-shirt, a double T-shirt, so that there's no obvious sign that I've got a pad on. It, it does become this, you know, shameful, hidden world. And, you know, it's like cha it's saying about travelling away from home. The hotel room is a public-private space. And, you know, you sometimes forget that, People will come in to change the bed or, or do things. So, and in that environment, that's your private space. You still got to think about make sure my pads are hidden away. Or so it, it is a very difficult issue to to deal with because there is the shame and the secrecy around it. Is that making sense to you, Tonica? You seem to be nodding. Well, uh, some of it. I'm not very shy about it. Even my grandchildren know grandma's wearing nappies as well. So that's not the point, but I feel that if you talk about it, the, the other person 
is very shy about it or even offended that yeah. you talk about something like that. Yeah. And yeah. but I use this kind of thing to announce it. You know, I say, um, oh, next week I'm going to do a uh, webinar with uh, them. <laughs> That's about it, it, incontinence, and that go. makes a bit uh, more sense. It, it did occur to me that I was asking the wrong people that question because you've just agreed to do this very public thing. So I, I, I guess I should be asking the million <laughs> people that would have declined. How about how about you, Rebecca? Is it is secrecy? Is that an issue for you also? I'm not a very secret person. <laughs> And I've got some social media channels because um, in my other world, in my other life, I'm a blogger as well. So and I, I have been known on the walks. I, I remember walking through a, a lovely poppy field and I was filming it and, and I think I sneezed. And I went and told everyone, oh, Christ, I've just weed myself. <laughs> so, so the but, world got to hear about it. <laughs> exactly. And I thought, do you know what? You know, it's something natural it's what we you know it's what we sometimes do and I thought the way that I look at things because I'm quite open about you know what the issues that affect our family and I get feedback and I get people say do you know what that's oh I, I thought I was the only person that thought that I was the only thought right. person that saw this right. so my idea is that do you know what I'm not the only person that's going through this so if somebody else sees me sneeze and wean myself a bit and I say do you know what that's you know that it happens yeah then you're I'm, giving you know, permission to other people yeah, to, yeah. Uh, one one last thing I want to ask you about on this, and then I want to ask you really more about how how you manage in terms of products. But the thing I want to ask you about is smell. I think probably every person with incontinence I ever talked with is scared stiff that they smell. They almost never do, <laughs> but the fear that they might is a big is is this a, a big thing for you guys as well? Yep. Yeah. Huge. Um, so how, what do you do about that? Do you do you just make sure the window's always open, or do you use lots of deodorant? Or what? Do you, how do you how do you handle it? For me, I handle it by changing quite often and putting the waste in a closed bag and then in okay. another bag and bring it to the waste every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I think I get a bit paranoid about it and probably change maybe too often sometimes i do check my underwear for signs of wet patches bowels obviously are a lot worse and that needs to be sorted out instantly if i'm going to be in an environment where i may not be able to get to the loo immediately i sometimes wear those awful um plastic pants over the top that gives uh, protects from odor a little bit no it's something in a, I do probably wash more often. I do use deodorant in situations to cover up. I mean, I've heard, I've gone to continence nurses and they say, well, exactly what you said, you know, you'll have 10 people and they say nine out of 10 people, they won't know that they're incontinent. So I know the the fear is not matched by the reality, but the mental health side and your fear yeah, yeah. that, people do know yeah means that, that you become you know sensitized to any hint that that, yeah. that could be a problem and i yeah. know it's more psychological fear than reality but it, it is something that does certainly uh, play on my mind a lot of the time yeah. yes yeah yeah i can see that let me ask you folk now about the products that you use and how well you think you can manage the leakage that that you have to deal with I wonder maybe we could start with Tonica again. You've each of you already said a little bit about this, but so what's what's your routine, Tonica? What what do you particularly the absorbent products we're interested in in this in this context? So how well do they work to the extent that they don't? What are the what are the shortcomings? It has to work because there is nothing else. Right. And it's too uh, it has to be big because it has to contain quite a lot in one go. It never does, because if it's too much, it's always a leakage. But also, if you use only a pad and you go to the toilet and you go to the toilet in a hurry, the backside of the pad drops and drops into the toilet. And that you realize too late. Well, if you're at home, it doesn't matter too much. But if you're out, it's rather uh, unpleasant. So that would be a big 
improvement if that was like uh, the sanitary napkins. They've got the uh, adhesive strip in it. Okay. And if, that, if that was there or a small one somewhere, that it sticks to the pan you use to have it uh, done. And uh, for the night, I use the kind of thing, you know, with the uh, adhesive strips at the side. Mm -hmm. And they fit nowhere. I've got, I need the nearly biggest size, but it fits not properly and it also leakages. It's okay. uh, not very uh, consumer uh, friendly, I would say. Can I just clarify something with you, Tonica? So when you talk about the the back end of the product dropping in into the yeah. toilet, do you mean that you want to put it back on? Well, if it's only a bit uh, drops on it, in it, then yeah. I use it again. Of okay. course, I'm not uh, throwing away. I always, yeah. I, I yeah. already produce uh, so much waste that right. I uh, try to keep it as low as possible. Got you. Okay, got you. And then the other thing you talked about was the fit, which I know is a real challenge for manufacturers because we're all different shapes and sizes. I know. And you can't have a million sizes on the supermarket I shelf, know. you know. But that's that's a point very well made because if it doesn't fit, it's it's going to limit performance, isn't it? Yeah. And also, I have to wear two sizes bigger slacks to okay. uh, to make it invisible. Okay, to take account of the space that it takes up, yeah. got you. Yeah. How about you, Chris? Is the situation? Do you relate to what Tonica just said? No, I, I, I certainly do re relate a lot to what Tonica said. I have, again, because I had similar issues to Tonica in terms of the volume of leakage and also the bowel issues. I tend to go for the bigger product. And there is the issue if you leak when you're sitting down, and obviously. My anatomy is slightly different to my two <laughs> colleagues and the padding for men needs to be more at the front. And, that, and that's certainly an issue. And if you're sitting down and you lose your bowels, or your bladder, it's a different situation to if you're standing up. And also, I totally relate to Tonica's issue at night time. I used to use smaller products because I leak less, but over the years it's got worse. So I tend to use the tape style products all the time now. And there is that issue if you sleep on your side, no matter what size big pad you have at night, you will still leak. And there's also the issue of fit. And I wear those Lycra type short for continence pads just to hold everything in because things move around. And then there is always the chance that things will move and then you leak down your leg or something. And so there's right, always right. things to think about. So that's interesting. You both of you are saying that, that we've some way to go, really, in terms of containing leakage. Is that is that fair? Yes. For, for you, at least, and some of yeah, your For me, it is, so yes. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Rebecca? Because I know you tackle things a little differently. Obviously, you, you've said that the volumes you're leaking are, are, are rather less than Tonica and Chris are talking about. But tell us how you contain your leakage. Yeah, um, I think it's mice. They're constantly weeing wherever they go. That's kind of me. So it's kind of like little bits, <laughs> little dribbles. But over the course of the day, um, that can make me feel quite insecure and feel like, you know, maybe I'm I'm starting to smell a bit. But then going on, I, I've actually used the DIY way of doing things, which is just a rolled up bit of tissue paper. And then I've used um, the tiny little discrete pads. And the trouble that I have we're, well, with both of them. Well, the first one obviously just falls apart after a while anyway. And the second one, I find I get quite, I'm quite a sweaty person anyway, whether I'm doing all of my fitnessy things or not. And I find that anything that is like a pad instantly just locks everything in and then just makes me sweat. And then that then smells. Um, so that's where I really feel very, very insecure. So the, the things that I need, because I'm wearing like sports outfits and things, I need something to be discreet. I mentioned that I do pole. I was actually at pole on Sunday and I did actually have an accident when I was at pole on Sunday. I didn't have anything on at the time. But with, if you can imagine pole, <laughs> you do wear little tiny little things. So you do need something that's kind of discreet to fit into that. And in my situation, contain the little the little dribbles that I get when, yeah. especially when I'm throwing myself up a, a metal pole. 
So I can I, I can just see now the the niche specialist product from one of the companies, <laughs> the pole dancers pad. Don't you think? Yeah, can if we can make them that? some funky colours, that'd be really cool. Yeah, there you go. I think there could be there could be a marketing opportunity there. Maybe it probably is. You, you could be famous. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Something I wanted to ask all of you that you haven't mentioned, but again, I think it commonly comes up, is about comfort and skin health. So mm. do, you, do you have to be careful with your skin or is that not an issue for you? Or Chris, you sound like you might be relating to that. Yeah, no, um, I'm involved in a project with, and I know it gets termed incontinence associated dermatitis, IAD, and I have had times when particularly the bowel issues because that that's quite corrosive on skin and I've been in situations where I've had a bowel accident and not been able to change immediately and and that can cause skin problems and again it's also about knowledge I use a barrier cream now but when I first started on this journey I didn't know about things like that and that can really cause a, a, a lot of damage to skin and I know with elderly relatives and, and, and other hospital patients that are in pads all the time or in bed, that can be a real problem. You can end up with ulcers and things. But I, on a personal level, I have had problems. And certainly, I think if you're doubly incontinent, the combination of the urine and, and bowel problems can, can be difficult. So, yeah. I, I mean, you know, changing, if you change and are able to change and you can clean yourself, and like Tonica, I have a huge bag that in, contains wipes cleansing foam and barrier creams you, you can and, and if you if you manage it well it's not normally a problem but you know I can relate to the heat issues with with what Rebecca was saying the bigger pads the pads have got better over years because they're breathable but you know something that was a plastic back one is dire you know you're sweaty and then you end up with all the issues around you, you know sort of chafing mm -hmm. and sweat so mm -hmm. yeah it, it, for me it is a is an issue but well managed you can by and large make it okay but the problem okay. is it can be once you have an issue it takes a while for it your skin to recover once it starts it's difficult well if you can prevent it is the best option gotcha how about you tonica is that is that true for you you have to be careful of your skin or is that not an issue I'm the lucky one out here. Never a skin problem at all. Hey, well done. <laughs> Very well, good. Well, use barrier cream as well. Okay, okay. It's a like... standard uh, joke in the family. We you uh, call it Dario cream, <laughs> <laughs> like the friends Dario. <laughs> Very good. How about you, Rebecca? It's, it's, you already mentioned about sweating, but that's, I think you mentioned that more in the context of smelling than skin health. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I don't. I don't think I've ever had any issues around because no. obviously, if it, as soon as I realise that that's that's an issue, then I yeah. will go and sort myself yeah. out. So yeah, yeah. hasn't course. got to that point. Gotcha, gotcha. I tell you something that fascinates me in all of this. When I when I started out forty years ago companies had their pad for incontinence it was for both genders any age any severity any everything mm -hmm. here is our product for incontinent people and i think if, if there's one big change i've seen over that period is the realization that the market if you put it in those terms is really quite segmented you're all talking about the same kind of issues of secrecy and skin health and smell and containment of leakage and so on. But the way that that has to be delivered for you is quite specific to your lifestyle and your particular priorities. Now, I think sometimes that isn't appreciated too well. There is a, there is a diversity here. It's not all one homogeneous group. But uh, so it's an interesting observation, I, I think, if I, I look back, back over a few years. So if I were to ask you now then, because we hope that actually people who are going to be listening to this interview, there should be some creative people there who are pretty good at addressing needs when they're identified. So if you had the ear of all of these people and you had a wish list, what would you like your products to deliver better? Or maybe things you'd like them to do that they don't do very well or that they don't do at all yet? Tonica, what would you what would you say? The adhesive but with the huge pads, that would be a lot of how do you say it easier to wear. I'm right. sure. That's the only uh, actually 
the first thing that comes to mind for me. The other things, well, they're not nice, but I can manage. Okay. But that is because, of, see, I used to use them at night as well. But yeah. at night, I'm uh, disorientated and I'm yeah. um, very sleepy because of my other uh, illnesses. Got and, you. And you have to do it in the dark because you don't want yeah. to uh, be obtrusive and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. it's always, and I forget it, don't for us. Yeah. yeah. So, so just to be clear, Tonica, you so what you would like this adhesive to do is what? Secure the product in place? better yes. in your clothing yes. is that if I, yes when uh, i have special pants uh, to uh, keep them in place okay. but i have to pull them down and okay. then it stays because it's uh, it's uh, sticky to your bum and, okay and then when you sit down there it drops okay so this is to do with the ergonomics of, of changing them as yeah. well i think yeah. am, am i am i have i got that right okay how about you chris is that what what will be on your wish list I think I've got about a thousand things on my wish Oh, wow. Well, give us the first three. <laughs> give us the three at the top of the okay. pile. You know, you were saying about, you know, everyone's uh, different needs, but I think even the same person can have different needs at a different time. Right. So I can relate to Rebecca. If I want to go for a walk, I don't want to necessarily wear a really big pad. And at night, I want something that I'm not so worried about, maybe discretion, but I want to work well. And then maybe there's a sort of, you know, regular day type pad. But for me, it's it's always that compromise between the discretion of a product and the absorbency. And it tends to be the thicker the product. I mean, I know that the technology and, you know, you and I have talked about this before. The technology is such that it, it, the products have got thinner and better. But I still think there is, you know, a way to go. And obviously, Anatomy wise with men and women, you know, the padding needs to be in different place potentially for men than, than women. And the manufacturers have taken that on board and the pull on style pants. You basically want something that can take away the waste product with minimum thing that you can keep on that is unobtrusive and is comfortable to wear and also doesn't necessarily look like a, a child product but obviously <laughs> there, there are compromises that you have to make and you know if nasa been struggling over the years uh, with it, it you realize that it is not an easy issue and the more i understand this field the more i realize that there are no easy fixes but there's lots of things that, that could be improved i think right I'm very really intrigued by what, one of the things you said, which I've heard a lot in the last few years, is the realisation that, that the same person may want a different way of managing things depending on what they're doing, time of day, at home versus out of the house, at work or with friends or whatever. And I think that's, that's so important. So it, it might not even be down to so which one product is best for a person. The answer might be a, a, a set. How about you, Rebecca? What's going to provoke you to give up your wadges of tissue? <laughs> I think it'd have to be more breathable in my case and discreet enough to be able to wear with leggings and things. OK. And obviously, because I'm going to be moving about quite a lot with some of the activities that I do, something that stays in place a bit better because I can find that they've sort of ridden, even with the sticky back and everything, they've kind of like ridden up. Or The, the, the trouble that you get with the discreeter ones is that they're slimmer and right. you end up with this tiny little screwed up mess in the end. So you've actually okay. got a problem where it's not going to be doing anything because it's got twisted with all the movements gotcha. that you're doing. Gotcha, yeah. Whereas, obviously, if I'd worn something bigger, then I'm lending myself to being obvious to people in the class that I'm wearing yeah. something. Yeah. So, so you've got, you want a, a combination of discretion, but with confidence. So not, yeah. not so discreet that you might miss it, as it were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I can see that. And Is so there anything else in there? I was going to say breathable as well. And I know, I know yeah. um, that we've been saying that, you know, that has improved over the years, but I still find that and maybe it's because of the activity I'm doing as well. But I just think that yeah. they need to be more breathable in that respect or, right. or a way of um, locking in the smells. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So. I'm, in, I'm encouraged that actually that each of you in your way have said, well, hey, things have moved on, you know. So, so I think there's a gratefulness for what's been achieved so far. Things are certainly a whole lot better than they were. 
But I think you're all saying in an encouraging sort of way, but there's more to go yet. There's more improvement to be had. Wow. How about you, Tonic? Have you been listening to these folks? Have you come up with something else that you would like fixed? Well, you... I heard that there was one product for a person, but here in Holland, I can order three or four different products yeah. and put them for the time being, so I can change around. That's interesting. Right. I think you're a, you're a little ahead of the way things are in England on that one, I'd say. But there uh, we go. I've got three different types uh, of uh, products here. Three months so, ago, uh, behind me there is a door and it's up to, to the ceiling now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's your pad store, is it? I, I want to <laughs> ask you something, but I'm just going to give um, Jack a little warning. Jack, maybe you've got a question or two in a minute. What I was going to ask Tonica is if you could take us through, you said you have three or, different, three or four different products. Yes. Could you tell us which ones you use in which circumstances and why? Well, I've got the heaviest pad. I use that when I go to the shop and uh, out uh, of the door sometimes. Okay. I've got the one step less heavy pad. I use that when I'm at home. And yeah. I've got the, I call it pamper type. I don't know how the other call it. I think they call it slips. Uh, and I use it at night. Gotcha. So, so that's three. So it sounds like you've got the real absorbent one when you want to be bulletproof when you're out outside, and no, then and you've got a daytime at home and a nighttime at home. Is that no, is that and right? Nighttime, uh, yes, that's more or less right. The yeah. nighttime stuff I also use when I go to the theater, uh, to the theater because oh, okay. I can't go out uh, very quick. Okay. Okay. Mm. Wow. So that's, gotcha. uh, So you've thought you've thought this through. You've got your kind of which oh, well, product I've, will work best for your different circumstances. I had thirty years of experience. So oh, there you go. You're an experienced wearer. I am. <laughs> that's, that's very impressive. Very impressive. Jack, is there anything that you have you been scribbling down hundreds of questions here? Or you, go go for it. I did want to ask that that same question to, to Chris that you just asked Tonica. The I imagine dealing with both urinary and bowel incontinence, you probably have a, a couple different options that you like to use. And if so, can you explain what situation calls for which product? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's very similar to Tonica actually. Nighttime, I would use the slip style product so my night isn't disturbed and you do tend to over the course of a longer time obviously you leak more and, and have issue in terms of my bowel i don't i i use the bowel clearance obviously but pad pad wise i do exactly the same as the bulletproof when you're out and about if i'm going on a train for example i always do pad up very well because you never know whether the loos are broken so when you on a car journey you know you want something bigger but as, as tonica says when you're at home you don't need as big a product or as absorbent and if i know i'm just popping to the shops i wouldn't wear a really big product and, and obviously I, I i do mix and match as well and i get my products through nhs so they're reasonably helpful in terms of giving me a choice of product but i am limited by the number and I do end up having to top up myself with extra things like the sort of pull on style thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it is about choice. And as Tonica said, you do get experience and it's it's a hit and miss experiments to try when you first have issues. And then obviously, if your condition changes, you have to sort of move up or down or what have you. So it's a learning curve and it, and it can be an expensive learning curve as well, which can be problematic. Yeah, absolutely. I guess maybe a wishful thinking question. If there was a product that in theory could could cover all of that, you know, the kind of light leaks and the heavier pads and the overnight, I mean, would you jump at the chance to to, to try that out? Oh, yeah. I've, 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 I've often thought about designing something myself. You know, I, I, I see the limitations of certain products and I appreciate that there's been a a lot of thought put into them but you can certainly see you know with, with alan being a material scientist you can see that there's always that issue of cost against the actual product itself and there are things that you could come up with that you, you know maybe more maneuverable but i i know that 
things like the elastines or lycra is expensive and absorbent, super absorbent material is expensive as well. And there's the environmental issue. I was on a conference recently mm -hmm. talking about the environmental impact. And, you know, mm -hmm. as Tonic was saying, you do feel guilty that you're using a lot of plastic. But then there's the reality that you need a product that's going to work and that reusables are not always a possible option. So it's, but yeah, if you could come up with a product that was comfortable, discreet, and you could absolutely 100% rely on that, that would be the sort of gold standard dream product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that last part interests me because I, I, again, I've heard many, many times people say, well, you know, once I've had a, a, a mega accident with whatever it is, then, you know, I'm very nervous about using it again, that there is a, there's that kind of risk, you know, the what if, what could go wrong is a real, real issue. Sorry, Jack, I butted into your question stream. There you go. No, no, no worries at all. No yeah. worries at all. I wanted to touch on the point that Tanika and, and Chris, you just brought up kind of the sustainability side of things. It's a big trend in every industry and the, the absorbent hygiene product industry is no different. And wanted wanted to ask you all to kind of expand on, you know, you mentioned some of the guilt or the worry about needing to use these single use products because you have to, but it kind of going against the motivation or, or your want to be more environmentally friendly or sustainable and I was wondering if you could expand on that the incontinence industry is or you know incontinence market is a little bit behind maybe the menstrual health and baby care markets and offering some of these these sustainable products but moving in that direction I will say but it's definitely not there yet and it sounds like that's something that you all want you would you would want that yeah, it, it, I, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, an online one uh, in Finland, talking about sustainability with pads uh, at Tampere University. And it, it's certainly an issue, and particularly, with, you, you know, the plastic use. But at the same time, I do get worried when they're trying to phase out plastics in disposable wet wipes and things. And it's like they have to give a product that replaces it that's just as you know, that works just as well. You, you, you know, if you're going to replace something that does work with something that suddenly doesn't, then it's got to be a product that actually does work and is is sustainable. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are, I mean, obviously the tree pulp and what have you is, is what the sort of standard now and, and then the polymers and all those things. But I don't think it's beyond our thinking that we could look at sustainability in terms of like I have done with you reusables with bamboo or something and, and, and look at other possible materials. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it would be quite an exciting field, I imagine. And I don't see why they couldn't be used. And I, I believe, I think in Japan, they even use some, um, they use disposable nappies as a fuel for, for, so it's quite an interesting field. And my, my father was a material scientist, so I, I've got that interests like you know like alan's interest and stuff so but it, it i do worry because the amount you know the, the the amount of stuff i put in my bin each week is crazy and it's just also the add-ons it's the bed pads it's the disposable gloves it's the plastic bags to put products in it's all this added sundry that you don't realize and then you think at the end of the week gosh you know I'd love to not fill my bin up and think less was going to the waste. But then in terms of hygiene and in terms of protection for yourself, you know, you, you, you still want the products to work. Yeah. But you do worry about that side. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. And Tonic, I see you agreeing and, and you mentioned it earlier. Well, I started off with towels, old towels to keep the uh, dustbin empty. But that wasn't it didn't work. Not at all. Mm. So that was uh, and plastic uh, things like that. But that was mm. a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. It does seem to me though that there is a somehow the tide has has turned, has changed. There is now, I think, a far greater desire to sort these things. Obviously, there aren't there aren't trivial, simple solutions. But it's it's how to move in those directions without compromising performance, isn't it? That's the if you want to capture it in one core challenge, I guess that's probably it. Well, you have to to feel comfortable with it. Yeah, gotcha. 
can I slip in another question that's kind of sideways of that? And that is that another trend that we've seen in the last maybe 10 years or so, I would say is a move toward products resembling more regular underwear. Yeah. Um, so particularly with like the pull-up pants and that kind of thing, you know, they at least notionally look like regular underwear and the and the men's ones in particular don't look quite so frilly and ladylike as they used to. Is that important to you or is that kind of cosmetic irrelevance? It's okay if it performs the same way or even better than what we have now. Okay. And that's uh, the main thing. If they were okay, yeah. that they'll do work and they look even yeah. a bit nicer, oh, then it's nice, but it doesn't uh, okay. have to. So it's on it's on the nice addition, but performance is the main thing for you. Is that is that fair? How about you, Chris? Would you say the same? Um, I, I, I'm slightly different. I, I, I would like a product that does look. I mean, I think there's two markets anywhere. There's a sort of consumer market, the supermarket that people will hide their issue and, and maybe not involve medical people and just go and buy a product. And they tend to be the, the. And again, it, it, there is a divide between male and female. And I'm grateful that there are products now that are darker color. Um, they seem to, you know, black or gray or blue is man color. And it, 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 it's, but it, it's quite interesting because, you know, this this obsession with white being clean and, and, and also, you know, we, we've been, in, I've been involved with projects looking at, in, you know, with ethnicity and skin color and, oh, okay. and, 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 and there's the flesh tone colored products, but obviously everyone's got different skin tone and, and, Right. And that, yeah. at least people are beginning to think about that. And, you know, a, a, a bright white product is a nightmare because it can be spotted a, a long way off. And yeah, I gotcha. and there, are t there tend to be two markets. There's the sort of medical market, the hospital market, where it, it's maybe more on the product itself. But then yeah, there's the right. consumer market. And the, the, the problem is, for me, the consumer market tends to, they look good, but they're less absorbent. So I, as much as I like the look of them, and there is the issue if you've got something that's pulled up and down and you need to change it. People remember if you're wearing a pair of jeans, that requires taking your trousers off and what have you and, okay, and yeah, putting, putting a product back on again. So nice. there's always pros and cons to all this. Yeah. But, but it sounds it yeah. sounds from what you're saying is it may be a little more than tonica. That that appearance, that attempt to normality is maybe a little more ticks your box a little more than yeah. it does tonicas, I I think. How about you, Rebecca? No, I, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm not in a situation where I'm getting anything on the uh, on the NHS. I'm buying these things myself, so I am going to the, you know the supermarkets and getting yep. things. And I'll be honest with you, I quite often favour the menstrual pads over the other ones because oh. because they're cheaper and also it means that I can get them for my daughter and then we can double up. Okay. I'll be honest with you, it does break my heart when I have to throw things in the bin. And obviously with, with my DIY ones, they can just go in the toilet like, you know, like normal toilet paper. So I don't feel so bad about that. And the sustainability is, is quite, a, quite a big issue for me. I think we're all in the situation where we, we're all thinking along the same lines. We'd all love to do something better for the planet. But, you know, whether we can or not is, is you know, and, and still have a product that's does what it's supposed to do is another matter altogether. But yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm when I do get things, I'm buying them. And I'll be honest with you, uh, I know I've said about it needing to be discreet, but also cost is is a big thing for me. Sure. Yes. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I will uh, honestly, obviously, if, if if it's my kids, I'd spend you know millions and millions and millions. <laughs> if it's a bit like me, I just go. I just go yeah. for the yeah. shops. <laughs> That was a question I wanted to to ask, and I think the situation in some of the countries in Europe is probably different than here in the United States, where you maybe have more cost effective or government supported options. We we don't necessarily have that here, but one, it's each of you, each of you to kind of touch on maybe some of the limitations or frustrations with the cost of, of products, because I imagine that ha as you mentioned, Rebecca. I mean, it's in your mind when you're when you're purchasing, trying to find the balance between cost and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. mm, that sounds right. Sounds right. No, no. Just going to say that cost is an issue, and for me, but also the NHS in terms of 
and the pull-on style are more expensive because I think they have more light type material in them. And so, yeah, for, I mean, and there is a premium. You do pay for a you do pay at a higher price for a, a more more comfortable product. I think the uh, yeah. uh, the sort of cheaper end of the market is more the sort of less breathable. So it, it is an issue. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we're actually coming to the end of uh, end of our time now. So I guess it would be good, firstly, to to thank you. I hope I hope you've enjoyed joining us and having the opportunity to to say your piece. But it, I, I've listened to folk living with incontinence for lots of years now, but I still find it very humbling to hear you tell your stories and to explain what's important to you. And please continue to do it because there are some very creative people around who are, are very interested and motivated to do things better so that people like you declaring things clearly can, can only help with that process. So uh, I would want to thank you so much for joining us. I imagine Jack would echo that also. Yeah, I can't can't thank you you all enough. I appreciate you allowing me to join the call and and share your stories with me and being open and and honest about it. And I just want to share my appreciation for for allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Well, there you have it. I'm not sure how you could hear those stories and the feedback from the panelists and not think that just maybe there are some areas of improvement for the products you make. Whether it be adding an adhesive backing to keep larger pads in place, like Tonica mentioned, a better balance between absorption and discretion, like Chris requested, or Rebecca's request for better breathability and improved stay in place performance for pads. There's certainly no shortage of ideas out there for better products. So hopefully what you heard from these three panelists and what you will hear from three more panelists in a few weeks will leave you with some great ideas for how your own products can be improved to better serve your consumers like Tonica, Rebecca, and Chris. For our next episode, we'll be bringing you part two of our interview with Tina Lee and Rocky Yeah on the APAC market. Attached to Hygiene is brought to you by Bostic and is hosted by me, Jack Hughes. It is produced and edited by me with the help of Paul Andrews, Michelle Tonkovitz, Emery Chernis, and Nikki Ackerman at Green Onion Creative. Our theme music is by Jonathan Boyle. We'd like to extend a special thank you to our moderator for today's discussion, Alan Cottenden, who you can find on LinkedIn. And a very, very big thank you to our three panelists for sharing their stories, Tonica, Rebecca, and Chris. As a thank you to the three of them, we made a donation on their behalf to their preferred incontinence-focused charity, and we'd like to encourage all of our listeners to do the same. And to help you do that, we have listed their preferred charities in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>